After the Apocalypse, a pandemic survival story. Season 3, Episode 11, The Zoo. Bill the dog sniffed and licked Zane's face, but got no response. He continued working his nose down the length of Zane's form, lingering at the upturned van sneakers. Satisfied for now, the big dog collapsed with a thump to watch the proceedings. A cloud of dust rose and settled onto his curly fur. Janet looked over the old man's shoulder as he examined the kid on the ground. So, did you kill him? The old man grumbled something under his breath that she didn't quite catch. And then something she could. No, he's not dead, and you're the killer. I'm the doctor, remember? She frowned and considered a few responses before letting it go. Seriously, what's the prognosis? How bad is it? He'll live, the old man said. Probably, anyhow. Looks like he's got a concussion and a broken arm. We should bring him to his people so he can get help, Janet said. The old man stood with a grunt, his knees popping, and looked up at her. Do you think that's a good idea? Should we get tangled up in this business? We came to find Paul. His face tightened. We can't leave him, she said. He's hurt, Janet paused. And he's someone's kid. What if he was your kid? K.J. the killer is now Florence Nightingale. Jeez, lady, it's getting hard to keep up with you. Come on, she ignored him. It's the right thing to do. And besides, it could be like a peace offering. Gain us access to whoever these people are. Or we could leave them and go find out for ourselves. We're getting close to the college. He became serious and darkened. Helping this kid is the right thing to do. I know you'll agree if you think about it. She said firmly, but added, If there's killing that needs to be done, I'm your girl. Don't worry. Okay, Florence. I can field splint the broken arm, but how do we move him? And where do you suggest we take him? Can't we rig up a stretcher or something? She asked, looking around the construction site. And we'll go up the road to where we saw that smoke. We drag him over there. Then what? The old man asked skeptically. We have a peace offering, and maybe we find out what we can about your son in the college. While the old man splinted and stabilized the kid's arm, K.J. constructed a rough litter from a Y-shaped tree branch and rope. They took turns with the litter, but Janet did the lion's share of the work. The athletic kid was lean, but still tipped the scales at a healthy 160-odd pounds. The litter took most of the weight, and on the smoother road surface, Janet was able to pull the rig along at walking speed with reasonable effort. It was a tribute to her years of consistent training in the pool and in the weight room at the gym in her office complex. All those early morning sessions paying off now unexpectedly in the apocalypse. The old man might have the leg speed and endurance edge, but she was all around fit. Bill the dog trotted along out front, occasionally circling back from his point position to sniff the young man on the litter with canine curiosity. Janet studied the old man. He had become more withdrawn and brooding as they got close to the college. She felt compelled to try to help. The only way she knew how to help was to open the door to the conversation and then to listen. 
One of the useful things that she had learned from her practice was that hard conversations were best approached head-on. Circling the topic and sidling up to it with artfulness was a waste of time and energy and made you sound dishonest. The old man felt her eyes on him and bridled. What? What now? What's the deal with you and your son? She asked bluntly, but without malice. The old man looked at her like she had slapped him, unprovoked. What do you mean? he said, and after a brief pause to recover his composure, stated, He's my son! As if that explained everything. Yeah, I know. He's your son. I get it. I lost two kids, and that almost pushed me over the edge. But, she continued, there's something else. You're acting strangely. The closer we get, the more you withdraw. Family history, the old man growled dismissively. She stopped and stared incredulously at him. Come on, I'm here with you. We fought together for months now. What's going on with you? What are you, my shrink now? Tell me. Okay, okay. Last time Paul and I were together, it didn't end well. There were some hard words. Even if he's alive, I'm not sure he wants me to find him. She put her hand on his shoulder. That was then. That was a different world. You can't change any of that. None of us can go back. She paused. The only thing we can do is keep moving forward and try to leave this place better than we found it. That's what we're doing. I know. It's just that the truth is, in a way, I already lost him. But there was always hope that we might get back together somehow. Now that we're getting closer, I'm going to lose him for real, and I'll never be able to fix that. Janet squeezed his shoulder and said, Whatever happens, we'll handle it together. Two survivors and a dog, thrown together by the apocalypse and united by shared trauma, crouched behind a tree in a thicket. They had arrived at the place where the smoke was coming from. It was a trailer park, the permanent kind of trailer park, where the trailers had been put up on blocks and made into housing. There was a six-foot chain-link fence around the whole park with a neat hedge of holly bushes. There's definitely people living there, the old man said. How many trailers do you think? Janet asked. He looked at her quizzically and said, How would I know anything about trailer parks? I thought you were an expert in everything. She smiled. Rough guess, he replied, rising to the challenge. Looks like maybe two acres. Let's say 15 to 20 trailers per acre. So 30 to 50-ish trailers. Janet thought for a second. Could be a hundred people living there, if it was full occupancy. I suppose, but it's probably not that many. Probably not, she smiled. Only one way to find out. Okay, let's move up to that hedge and see what we can see. From the hedge, they had a clear view into the open yard at the front of the park. There was a metal gate that was chained and locked. Behind that, a small manager's office with a wall of mailboxes stood next to a fenced-in area. Six rows of neatly spaced mobile homes stretched away down parallel roads. A paved walkway ran around the perimeter following the fence. There's someone coming, Janet said in a low voice. They both scrunched down into cover. Blots! Blibe! The old man instructed Bill the dog. The dog lay down, but stayed alert and expectant. From their hiding spot, they could see two women approaching who were walking briskly. 
The women appeared to be in their fifties or sixties and heavy set. They were walking with purpose around the track and talking nonstop. They wore bright windbreakers and yoga pants. One was carrying hand weights. The other had a pink headband. From their concealed spot, Janet and the old man watched dumbfounded through the hedge. As the women disappeared around the bend, they took a wave of non-stop banal chatter about hair care and someone named Marge with them. Janet and the old man stared at each other incredulously. She was the first to speak. Power walking? Weird, the old man confirmed. Let's move up closer to the gate. The first thing they noticed as they moved closer was a steady noise coming from the fenced-in area by the office. The old man couldn't be sure, but it sounded like the ebb and flow whirring of a rowing machine. He'd had one in his office gym many years ago, before he was kicked out of his job. From their new vantage point, they could also see a man wearing a red beret and green smock seated in front of an easel with a palette and brush. He was dabbing at his palette and considering the sun as it sank into the mountains to the west of the park. In the front of a trailer further down the main road, another man was cooking something in a large metal pot over an outside cook fire contained in cinder blocks. What do you think? the old man asked. I don't know what I was expecting, but I wasn't expecting this, she replied. I don't see any guards or guns, he said tentatively. It looks like a retirement community, she said in return, but in a way that made it clear she didn't believe what she was saying. Do you want to go in or not, the old man said. Your call. She thought for a moment and then said, Yeah, I'll grab the kid and walk up to the gate. You stay out here with Bill until I give thee all clear. Janet slowly approached the front gate, dragging Zane on the litter behind her. She considered how to handle this situation. Engaging these people held risk, but it was a risk she had some familiarity with. Janet was reminded of the value of a head-on direct approach. She decided to instigate the interaction without showing her cards and learn from the response. If something went south, they could always dump the kid and run. She walked without hesitation right up to the gate and shouted towards the man with the easel. Hello, I need help. I've got an injured kid here and I need help. The man at the easel was startled, jumped up and blinked at her for a moment. He didn't reach for a weapon or a run, she noticed. Instead, he walked quickly to the fence and said something to whoever was behind it, and the whirring noise stopped. A few seconds later, a large man emerged from the workout area with a towel around his shoulders. The two of them approached. When they got within ten feet or so, they stopped and appraised Janet. Who are you? The man with the towel asked. He looked to be in his sixties. He was wearing a sweat band and fingerless workout gloves dangled from one of his hands. His bald head was pink with sweat. He wore lycra shorts and a singlet marked with sweat. To cap off the look, a large clump of salt and pepper hair stuck out over the top of the singlet from his chest. In fact, the man was covered in graying black hair that would make a lowland gorilla jealous. Janet replied, I have an injured kid here, and I need help. The painter pulled out a pair of eyeglasses from his smock and looked around Janet. That's one of the kids, 
He looked at Janet and then at the man with the towel. One of the scouts, Zane, I think. What did you do to him? The man with the towel asked defensively. I didn't do anything to him. He crashed his bike, but he knocked his head and probably broke an arm. What do you want? Why did you bring him to us? Janet was momentarily confused. We, I saw the smoke from your fire and thought he was one of you. Charlie and that damn barbecue. Singlet man muttered to the painter, then continued. Pete, go get Margie and Phil. A few minutes later, a small crowd was gathering at the gate. A dozen or so older men and women were looking at Janet and her cargo, talking to each other. The painter, Pete, was returning with a stern-looking woman. She was striding towards the gate with such energy and purpose that Pete was losing the battle to keep up with her. The small crowd of onlookers parted to let her to the front. The woman was small but hard-looking, also in her fifties or sixties. It was hard to tell with the seriousness of her appearance. She scowled through the gate at Janet. Who are you, and what do you want? Look, Janet said, gesturing to Zane on the litter. I've got an injured kid here, and I'm looking for help. Janet met the woman's fierce gaze with her own well-practiced projection of strength and confidence, a sort of non-verbal, Don't mess with me. The small woman seemed to come to a decision. Do you have any weapons? A collapsible rifle and a hunting knife, Janet said without breaking eye contact. I'll need you to hand those over. The stern woman stated and continued, staring into Janet's eyes. Are you alone? Janet paused. She had a decision to make. But looking at these people, she didn't think they were a threat. Honesty and directness, once again, felt like the right course of action. Yes, I'm traveling with an old man and a dog. Well, call them in and let's have a look at them. The stern woman said. What's your name? She asked. Janet, replied Janet, relaxing a bit, knowing that now they were moving on to a new phase of these negotiations. I'm Marge. The stern woman didn't need to add that she was in charge. It was obvious. She pulled a collection of keys out of her pocket and moved towards the gate. Janet called the old man, who emerged from his hiding place with the dog. As Marge unlocked the gate, a man in a flannel shirt and jeans with long gray hair tied into a ponytail jogged up. What's going on, Margie? They found one of the patrol kids injured and brought him here for help. I don't think they're a threat, Phil. All right, but let's make sure we don't get involved in anything that puts the zoo at risk. Janet and the old man looked at each other. The inert form of Zane breathed softly, stretched out on a cot in the park's common building. It was an open area that had a lounge, tables, some exercise equipment, empty vending machines, and notice boards. The old man leaned over and conversed professionally with George. George was a hirsute man they had encountered at the gate. His real name was Dr. Pena Giorgio, and he had been a podiatrist before the pandemic. The old man was cleaned up. They had insisted. He had showered, trimmed his beard, and put on some new clothes. He was dressed in a sport shirt and golf pants, like someone you might see lining up for the early bird special at the local Denny's. The old man shifted uncomfortably, pulling at his ill-fitting pants. I think he'll be okay. We just need to keep him immobile for a couple days. George agreed with the diagnosis while manipulating Zane's feet and legs. 
No leg fractures, just some scrapes and bruising. The old man had been holding off on his questions, but now, since the time was right. What is this place? Why do you call it the zoo? George considered this question and spoke, choosing his words carefully. When the virus hit this area, it wiped out most of the people very quickly. The old man nodded. Yeah, that's how it's been everywhere. It seems to have erupted simultaneously, everywhere at the same time, with an unprecedented mortality rate. George continued. Most of us were working at the college when it hit. There were about 10,000 students and maybe 1,200 faculty and admin. He paused, considering what to say next. The kids, the students, survived at a much higher rate than the rest of us. That makes sense, the old man said. In the aftermath, the surviving students rallied around a techie grad student to lead them. They called him the Kaiju. They decided they were taken over and that the surviving admin and faculty and older people would be moved here to be kept out of the way. I don't know if it was us or them who started calling it the zoo, but it stuck. Don't trust anyone over 30, the old man mimed with a snort. You're prisoners here. No, we can leave if we want, but where would we go? There's nothing better out there. They keep us supplied and they patrol the area to protect against outsiders. We're safe here, but we can't go back to the school. So you're just waiting here to die. I wouldn't say that, George objected. We've got plenty of projects we're working on. We've got a self-government to sorts with Phil and Margie as the co-chairs. Phil was a dean of the agriculture school. Margie was the assistant to the provost. They keep things stable. The old man thought in silence about all this information. George turned and asked in turn, Why are you here? The old man now had to decide what to share with this man. We're survivors. I found the dog. Janet was in the city back east. We met up on the trail outside of Georgia and kind of fell in together. Yes, but how did you end up here? We're looking for my son, who was at the college. The old man looked at the floor. I see, said Dr. Panagiorgio in his best professional caregiving voice. Just then, Phil came running in, gray ponytail flapping, followed by a cleaned-up Janet who was dressed up in some sort of Jane Fonda workout garb. Janet caught the old man, smiling ironically at her new outfit and shrug, as if to say, Not my choice. Phil was agitated. There's a patrol coming. What do we do? George asked. Let's keep it simple, Phil said. You two, just blend into the crowd. We'll tell them that we found Zane after he crashed. Phil concluded, not sounding 100% sure of his own plan. They'll take him, and it'll be cool. Hello and welcome, my survivor friends. How are we doing? For those of you playing along, this is Season 3, Episode 11. For you time travelers, it is the Ides of January, 2023. We have crested the halfway point to the season and are drifting slowly downhill to the finish. I will share a couple of, well, not reviews really, just my thoughts, my impressions on a couple of movies and series and books and stuff that I've consumed over the last month or so. Uh, first is a book. I finished a 2017 book called Raven Rock by Garrett Graff. 
and this is a weighty analytical tome that chronicles the evolution of the United States preparedness plans for continuance of government, COG, through the Cold War and up into recent years. Now, friend Dave gave this to me when we were out in Cincinnati for the Flying Pig Marathon last April, and it is a dense, (laughs) scholarly book, chock full of facts and figures. It took me a couple of starts and stops to get through it, and I finished it just before the end of the year. This book details all the bunkers and all the other stuff that got built to ensure the United States government would survive a thermonuclear attack, at least long enough to hit that button to retaliate. Apparently, there's also a Vice Channel documentary that was based on this book in 2020, and it's called While the Rest of Us Die. I have not seen it. I have not even seen of it until I started researching this. The United States and its allies spent billions, billions, hundreds of billions of dollars digging bunkers and hollowing out mountains over the years. Most of these bunkers at this point have been decommissioned, but after 9-11, some were reactivated. And the biggest of these is called Mount Weather, a.k.a. Raven Rock. And it is located in Blue Ridge Summit, Pennsylvania, which is that part of Pennsylvania that's super close to Washington, D.C. That's why it's there. It has enough room to house the entirety of the United States Congress. Although why we would want to save them, I probably shouldn't comment on. There's also the Cheyenne Mountain Complex in Colorado. Uh, there's one under the, under the White House. <laughs> so the government had bunker fever during the Cold War. And almost every local government had a local bunker complex to sit out a nuclear war through the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And it is a bit surreal to read about because the underlying premise is that thermonuclear war was or is somehow survivable, which I'm pretty sure it is not. But why do we care? Why do you and I care about this? Because one of the classic apocalypse fiction tropes is people surviving in bunkers. Every good apocalypse story has bunkers, which leads nicely into another series I started watching called The 100. And this was done for the CW Network and ran from 2014 to 2020, but is now available on Netflix. I got two seasons in, and I'm not sure if I'm going to continue. I may be tapping out at this point. The first thing an observant viewer might notice is that this is a young adult novel adaptation. It's the classic group of teens battling the forces of evil. Think Maze Runner, Hunger Games, Harry Potter. It's a well-traveled road. One other observation is that, you know, a group of teenagers surviving, living in a space station for 100 years probably isn't gonna all be built like underwear models. You know, I'm guessing they'd look more like Golem, so they must have had some great jeans or a good fitness facility up there. And here's where it ties back into Raven Rock. I started watching this uh, right as I was finishing reading the Raven Rock book, and wouldn't you know it, the main nemesis in season two of The 100 is a group of survivors from the United States government in Mount Weather, Raven Rock. There you go. Yep, I walked right into it. So, if you have your Apocalypse Bingo card out, you can check off bunkers. All in all, I'd give uh, the first season, season one, maybe a solid C, and season two, they amp it up a bit, C+. But I tapped out early in season three. They had two genocides in three episodes, And that kind of turned me off for some reason. And I know we're trying to create moral tension, but do we have to wipe out entire groups of people, men, women, and children? Call me naive, but I just can't swallow it without some intellectual revulsion. I also watched my way through Wednesday, and I do appreciate Tim Burton's trademark dark cinematography, having grown up with it. I really like the main character. Jenna Ortega, who plays Wednesday. She's 
She did a great job. She's super likable. She's going to be a star. The plot and the storyline have some really dumbfounding choices, some big holes, and at points it's just silly and confusing. I guess, you know, they think you'll be so dazzled by the characters and the cinematography that the plot, you know, doesn't really matter. I'd give it a I'd give it a solid B though. Good popcorn watch. And finally, at least for today's discussion, I watched the movie White Noise last week with Adam Driver, based on the 1985 novel by Don Delilo. Now, a lot of people really, really love this novel. It's like a cult novel. I guess not a cult novel, because it was, it did sell a lot. It was very popular when it was published. But because of its complexity, this novel was declared, you just can't make that into a movie. So, as the story goes, director Noah Baumbach decided to say, hey, I can make that into a movie. He stepped up to the challenge, and this is what we got. I started watching it, actually, because and something I was reading online described it as an apocalypse movie. And it's not an apocalypse movie. It is an absurdist comedy, like, I don't know, The World According to Garp or Rushmore or any Wes Anderson movie. I almost turned it off 40 minutes in. <laughs> I did that thing where you hit the info button on the remote to see how much time is left, and but I stuck it out. Now, 90% of the people who watch this movie will hate it. <laughs> the people who read the book, which I have not, and uh, committed film students who like to hang out in dark rooms and discuss Francois Truffaut will like it a lot. If you do decide to take the plunge, make sure you hang on and watch through the credits because they have this hilarious Ode to Consumer Package Goods Bollywood number uh, in the ending credits, which is a must-watch. So, my friends, that's my update for the week. Remember, I can use your help to keep the lights on. We have subscription options on Acast and Patreon. I'll send you a patch. And I have added a new button on my website on oldmanapocalypse.com where you can buy me a cup of coffee. Because I know there are a bazillion podcasts out there asking for money, and I appreciate your support. As always, the links to everything will be in the show notes. And I will post this on the website. Drop me a line if I can do anything for you. We have uh, 288 people in our Facebook group right now, so that's cooking right along. And remember, whatever you do, stay out of that bunker. <laughs> but do keep surviving. <laughs>